The space community spans the globe, but there's one place where it all comes together, the annual Space Symposium. Space Symposium brings together commercial, government, military, research, and investment leaders to inform, engage, and connect with the global space ecosystem, and you can be a part of it. Welcome to State of Space 2023. I'm Tom Zellabor, CEO of Space Foundation. Since the start of our yearly State of Space series, the goal has been simple. Showcase the diverse perspectives and experiences that are part of today's global space ecosystem. What we've learned is those perspectives and experiences are increasing every year. With over 90 countries operating in space, and more companies and participants than ever before taking their place in a nearly half trillion dollar economic frontier, opportunities are flourishing. Today, we are in a new renaissance for space with revolutionary opportunities for shared exploration, commerce, research, innovation, and security. In 2022, we saw the largest number of satellite deployments ever the launch and lunar orbit of NASA's space launch system, and even altered the course of an asteroid. Happening alongside these amazing achievements were numerous private sector missions, as well as the first revealing images and discoveries captured by the James Webb Space Telescope. We're also experiencing firsthand how our dependence on space technology impacts everything from precision agriculture and environmental sustainability to medical care and national security. Quite simply, space is an indispensable critical infrastructure, and it's time it should be treated as such. When most people think of infrastructure, they think of roads, dams, bridges, and utilities. These elements of infrastructure are necessary for modern society to function and are appropriately treated as critical when it comes to policy, budgetary, and legal decision-making. Space should be viewed the same way. Today, space affords access and essential data and connectivity that is necessary for every country, industry, and community to be part of the 21st century. And it should go without saying that the disruption or destruction of space assets or access to it would have a debilitating effect on national and economic security that would ripple across the globe. Today, the U.S. Department of Homeland Security has 16 defined critical infrastructure sectors. Oddly, space is not one of them. The reasons are both political and economic. Many still fail to see just how essential space is to everyday life, and if it were designated as a critical infrastructure, the government would have to fund it in ways it is not prepared to do. That must change. As a retired Rear Admiral, I can't help to hearken back to the earliest days of the Navy to describe the role space plays. In 1794, Congress established the U.S. Navy to protect commercial ships from pirates in the Mediterranean and Atlantic waters. This branch of service operated under maritime law, securing our borders, ensuring safe trade and commerce, as well as international cooperation. It's difficult to imagine a world where the Navy hadn't performed this role. Like our oceans, no single country owns space. Today, countries and companies operate in space cooperatively for research, exploration, commerce, and security operations every day. As impressive as this is, it poses significant risks regarding our assets both up there and on Earth, as other countries possess and seek to acquire capabilities to adversely impact those assets. Just as the oceans needed international guidelines as established by maritime law, we also need them for space. 
These guidelines are how we will cooperate with and support other nations in the future, regardless of who is asking for help. The lives of people across our planet depend on space, and as such, we have a responsibility to one another to fund and protect it. Failure to appropriately exploit space will be a national and economic security downfall if we do not act strategically. With the establishment of Space Force and the current administration's national security strategy, the U.S. government has declared our dependence upon space assets, systems, and networks, and the need to protect them from a range of threats. But those recognitions do not go far enough. Space must be viewed, funded, and resourced as a critical infrastructure. To be sure, a formal or official declaration of critical infrastructure will not on its own mitigate those threats. However, a declaration of space as a critical infrastructure from the administration and U.S. Congress will allow the mobilization of policy and programmatic structures to better integrate space into the resilience planning and coordination efforts necessary to secure it. Those steps will secure the promise of a growing and enterprising space economy and all the services, resources, and people that depend on it today and for every generation. That has always been the intent with every other critical infrastructure, and the same should be true for space. Given what you will hear from our guests and their perspectives we've assembled for this year's program, the state of space today demands a new status, and the time for action has come. Thank you all for your time, and enjoy this year's State of Space program. Thank you, Tom. Hello, everyone. I'm Rich Cooper of Space Foundation. As Tom offered it in his opening remarks, the goal of our annual State of Space program is to share some of the diverse perspectives and experiences that are part of today's global space ecosystem. The five presenters we've assembled for this year's program deliver on that promise and more with their thoughtful and thought-provoking remarks. This year, you will hear leading voices representing industry, national security, education, the international community, as well as the news media. The views that each of our assembled presenters share are their own and they speak for themselves. As the preeminent leader for information, education, and collaboration across the global space ecosystem, we at Space Foundation believe that diversity of thought, experience, skills, talent, and personnel opens the aperture for all of us to better see and hear things that might otherwise be overlooked or unconsidered. We at Space Foundation open that aperture with Space Symposium, The Space Report, our Center for Innovation and Education, the Space Commerce Institute, and in classrooms and communities around the world. As we celebrate our 40th anniversary this year, in the midst of today's space renaissance, we at Space Foundation are even more committed to being a partner and resource for anyone who is seeking to better understand and be part of the global space ecosystem. We are inspired by this era of access and opportunity because we really do believe there is space for all. So thank you for joining this year's State of Space program and feel free to share your own thoughts on the State of Space with us at our LinkedIn page, at the upcoming Space Symposium happening this April 17th through 20th, or by email at support at spacefoundation.org. We welcome your insights and feedback. Have a great day and enjoy the program. While space has been a strategic part of the national security landscape for decades, in 2022, the role of space in national security played out on the front pages of newspapers, social media channels, and websites around the world. The shared imagery of the dynamic battlefront in Ukraine, produced by Maxar, Planet, and others in the commercial space industry, showed us all in color and down to a few meters what was happening there. The conflict in Ukraine has become in many ways a commercial space dependent war where imagery as well as communications platforms such as SpaceX's Starlink and other industry offerings have been game changers. 
So much so that the Biden administration's national security strategy specifically called out the importance and dependence upon having such commercially available capabilities in support of the national security mission. Joining us to talk about national security and space is Carrie Bingen, director of the Aerospace Security Project and a senior fellow with the Center for Strategic and International Studies, or CSIS, as it is well known. In addition to her role at CSIS, she's also served in senior leadership positions at the Pentagon, the House Armed Services Committee, and the private sector. Carrie, welcome to this year's State of Space program. It's great to be here, and thanks to the Space Foundation for doing this. Carrie, from a national security perspective, what is the State of Space in 2023? So I think in 2023, we will be in a period of transition and it's a year of hypothesis testing to see if investment strategies pay off. With the threat to space continuing to grow, the US government is making strategic shifts to resilient proliferated architectures. We'll see that come to fruition this year with the Space Development Agency's first tranche of satellite launches starting uh, in March, 2023. We'll also, we've also seen record private capital in the last few years that have fueled a burgeoning commercial space ecosystem. Space startups are now putting appreciable capability on orbit, showing value in Ukraine, as you mentioned, and their position for growth. But the economy and the boon of funding has slowed. The commercial market demand is not panning out as much as, as many thought. And you're seeing a shift to government work. So the question is, will we see enough market demand to sustain this commercial growth and the continued high investment? Space is a very capital intensive area. Or will we see a slowdown in consolidation? Carrie, you talked about the economics that are going on within the industry and for that matter, the government as well. But what are your other colleagues in the national security community seeing as other big challenges in 2023? Big challenges, speed and execution. If China is to be militarily prepared by 2027, as President Xi has said, or even earlier, that adds a sense of urgency to what we do in space. Space underpins any operations that our military undertakes away from our shores. That means we will have to fight with the toolkit that we have today. That's uh, the large aerospace companies, that's the commercial space sector, that's our allies and partners. So we need to figure out how do we integrate what we have across our ground systems, out into the field, the tasking systems and bringing greater automation and integration of those, integrating commercial sources, our allied and partner space capabilities, also executing what's in the pipeline and speeding up our, our space acquisition cycles. I think Assistant Secretary Frank Cavalli and his nine tenets, he has it right. So you've talked about those particular issues, and those are certainly front burner. But what issue is not getting the attention that it deserves? Say export policy and regulations, uh, which are hampering the space sector from greater cooperation with our allies and partners. We have a thriving commercial space sector. It is a competitive advantage for us, and it's an opportunity to work more closely with our allies and partners in areas like early warning. Uh, domain awareness, space domain, maritime domain awareness, and even the environment. Yet our export policies haven't kept pace with the state of technology and with foreign competitions. We can no longer say that the United States has the market cornered on space technology. This becomes even more acute if market demand contracts. To keep the commercial space sector healthy and not fully reliant on the U.S. government, these companies will need timely access to international markets and they have a valuable contribution to make domestically and internationally to our national security, to the economy, uh, and, and to science. Carrie, is there one person or player or organization that you think we ought to keep really close watch on this year? I'm watching General Saltzman, the new chief of space operations. Uh, I give a tremendous amount of credit to General Raymond. He built the foundation for the Space Force, the organization, and he created irreversible momentum. But I do look forward to seeing what General Saltzman does to build off this foundation. Uh, I, would in, I would look to how he's maturing thinking on space warfare and space warfare doctrine. 
uh, diving in on what space force structure and space force packages look like, as an example, and then the investment strategy that goes with them. And I look forward to seeing how he further develops the culture of the Space Force. What does the profession of arms look like for the Space Force Guardians? Terry, last question. Is there a particular mission or event this year that you're most looking forward to? So let me give you two. First, the Space Development Agency launches starting in March. We need to put points on the board to show the benefits of proliferated LEO architectures and the faster acquisition timelines that go with them. Second, I have to tell you, I'm just in awe of the web images of deep space. There was a lot of fanfare last year with those first images. This year, it's a year of implementation. Uh, we'll get to see a lot more data coming off web. So, so taking that to the next step with the data analysis and all of the scientific understanding that is yet to come about the early universe and distant gal galaxies, um, I'm just in awe of the potential uh, of what we're going to learn there. Terry Bingen of CSIS, thank you for joining this year's State of Space program. We look forward to seeing you at symposium and hearing more of your thoughts throughout the year. Thank you. Great, thank you. The first page of history is written by journalists. They chronicle the happenings, discoveries, and outcomes of our world, and the global space ecosystem has produced more than its share of headlines and compelling stories this past year. One of those notable chroniclers is Miriam Kramer, the senior reporter for space with Axios. Miriam produces one of the best weekly must-read newsletters aptly titled Axios Space that regularly scoops what is happening and she is also a frequent contributor to Axios's daily podcast and its other multimedia offerings. Miriam, thank you for joining this year's State of Space. Thanks so much for having me. Miriam, as someone who has chronicled so much of what's happened this past year, what is the State of Space in 2023? I mean, I think it's, uh, I think just to sort of sum it up very succinctly, I think the State of Space is strong. Um, there are so many launches happening. I can barely keep up with it, and it's my job to keep up with it. Uh, the uh, global space economy is growing. Um, you have multiple countries and companies that are aiming for the moon this year and in the coming years. It's a really interesting time to be following space. That said, it's not as if there aren't challenges when it comes to you know, the global economy in general being not so great right now that's affecting the space economy you also have um you know uh, companies and contracts and countries that are you know occasionally finding it more difficult to work together than they have been in the past i'm looking at things like the international space station and some of the tensions there between russia and the us and how it's in some way spilling over into space it is an interesting time to be following the space industry. Uh, and I think that everybody kind of feels that at the moment. So let me pull that thread on the challenges that you talked about, because you mentioned a couple there. What are some of the other challenges? What are some of the other big challenges that you and the media see that the space community is going to have to contend with this year? Yeah, well, I mean, one thing that I think that the that's in some way specific to journalists, but might be interesting for, for your audience here is that uh, I, I think the transparency is a real challenge in the space industry these days. Um, journalists are, I have to say, we're used to a lot of access when it comes to something like a NASA, NASA mission, particularly crewed missions. And when we're entering this new dynamic of having private companies take people to space regularly, including NASA astronauts, there's a real question of what kind of access we as journalists will get to those missions because it's not guaranteed. Nothing is guaranteed for us. And part of the issue when it comes to transparency is that in some ways, unless you know you are in deep with these companies and able to get around uh, you know, non-disclosure agreements and things like that, uh, we are we need more information from these companies in order to be able to present what's happening to the public in a fair way. And I think that that has become a real challenge in a few different directions. Um, 
you have a lot of companies that are kind of taking the tack that SpaceX has taken, which is in many ways to shut out the media from discussions, from uh, looks into what the company is doing. Um, and I think that a lot of other companies are following suit with that. And I think that in many ways, the space industry will be worse for it because, yeah, it's difficult to be asked hard questions. It's difficult to talk to a skeptical person like a reporter, but no one is trying to get anybody. I can say that for my colleagues. Like we are all very much interested in presenting a fair view of what's happening in space, but it's very difficult to do that if we don't get any buy-in, I would say, from these companies. So you talk about that challenge as to the transparency. Yeah. Is there another issue that isn't getting the attention you think it deserves? It's a great question. I, you know, I don't know if this, I think that actually this is getting some attention, but I believe it's getting a lot of attention from inside of the industry and maybe not so much from the public, but I am really interested in tracking what the coming end of the moratorium on regulating spaceflight for spaceflight participants will mean for the industry at large. Uh, I think that it's a really fascinating question. I mean, this moratorium has been extended multiple times since it was sort of first established in 2004. And now, you know, we're nearing the end of, of the first era of private human spaceflight in the U.S., so I'm really curious to see what the next era looks like. And that chapter is sort of going to start being written this year, assuming Congress allows the moratorium to expire. There are a lot of sort of unanswered questions. There are a lot of reports that we haven't necessarily seen uh, come to public light yet. Like I am, I think it's going to be a really fascinating storyline to watch play out this year. And I hope that a lot of people pay attention to it. Miriam, is there one person or organization to keep our eye on this year? There is, and I think it's the obvious answer. Uh, SpaceX is arguably the most important space company in the game today. Elon Musk is, I would say, the most important CEO in space these days. Uh, and it's a real question of what he will do this year. Um, his management of Twitter, his management of Tesla, his management of SpaceX has come under real scrutiny. Uh, I think that we're going to see more of that in the coming year. Um, and I think that SpaceX will likely continue to perform. Um, it is a beast when it comes to launch. It is a beast when it comes to everything else. <laughs> um, and I am really curious to see how, how uh, Starship works. Uh, I'm expecting to see an orbital launch this year. Uh, and I think we're going to need to see some movement when it comes to its human lander system uh, to know exactly what we're looking at as far as the first crewed Artemis landing. I mean, SpaceX has its hands in just about everything involving space today. Uh, and I really, I really don't think you can discount its importance. Is there an anticipated mission or event that you're most looking forward to in 2023? Yeah, I'm pretty excited to see what happens with these private moon missions. Uh, we have iSpace that is nearly to the moon uh, after launching last year. Uh, if they manage to land, they'll become the first private company to actually land on the moon in history. And I, I cannot wait to see what happens there. You have Astrobotic and Intuitive Machines that are also trying to land on the moon in the coming year. Um, I think that sort of private moon race and the development of the lunar economy is something that I am so fascinated by and something I'm planning to kind of keep an eye on through this year and the coming years. I mean, I think that this is a multi-decade change. Um, you know, you see the the locus of, of power in space has typically been the International Space Station, at least in the past few decades. Um, but now I'm seeing that move more and more to the moon. And I think it's incredibly exciting to see how geopolitical lines are being reformed there um, and see sort of what the, the landscape is going to look like for the coming you know, the coming decades in space. Miriam Kramer of Axios, thank you. And we look forward to seeing more of your stories this year. Thanks so much for having me, Rich. This is great. The greatest innovators of today's space renaissance is the private sector, whose ingenuity has revolutionized every facet of the global space ecosystem. From launches to imagery and services products, 
the commercial space industry has pioneered new approaches every step of the way. One of the pioneering innovators within the commercial space community is Jeff Mamber, who's the president, International and Space Stations with Voyager Space. Jeff is also the founder of NanoRacks, Mircor, and several other notable commercial space ventures. Jeff has joined this year's State of Space program and is going to share some industry perspective on today's State of Space. Jeff, thanks for joining us. Hey, thanks for the introduction. I loved it. Thanks. For Jeff, let's get right down to it. From your perspective as a veteran entrepreneur and a successful industry leader, what is the state of space in 2023? Well, I mean, it's it's funny. I can say it's uh, it's never been better, and I have a lot of concerns. Uh, we've all recognized finally uh, that commercial is an important, in fact, essential part of uh, our strategic and well-being and daily life is dependent on uh, what we do in space and having uh, space services. And so in that sense, uh, the uh, state of space has never been better. Uh, We've also unfortunately seen a demonstration with the uh, war in uh, Ukraine where we recognize, and even people who don't know much about space must recognize that uh, the uh, Earth observation pictures, the uh, Starlink, the there's all sorts of commercial space services that have been brought to bear on the conflict. Um, and so on the one hand, it's a wonderful time. And on the other hand, I, I have some concerns uh, we can get into um, as you wish. Well, let's talk about those concerns. What do you and your fellow colleagues in industry see as some of the biggest challenges that will be faced this year? We're in uh, what's uh, we're, we're in a very interesting time where uh, so many of my colleagues made a mad dash to go public through SPACs. Uh, they took the uh, capital from everyday investors, and a lot of them are unable to make the projections, and the stocks are doing very badly. And what I worry about, and I worry about a couple of things, Uh, you can't be a veteran of space and not worry about a lot of things. And one of the things I'm worried about is we're going to turn off a whole generation of investors uh, who invested in these great companies that it may have just been premature for them to go public. So the concern is, will we keep the uh, support of, um, of the retail investors on the street? That's one concern I have. Another concern I have is, like so many things in life today, we're losing uh, the the international supply chain. Uh, You introduced me as president of international for Voyager Space. Uh, My career has been uh, tapping into the international markets, making international uh, strategic partnerships the way we do in the auto industry, the way we do in the internet, biogenetics. Um, But I worry with the um, conflicts and the perceived risks that we have, Um, across the globe, that we're going back to a period where we're going to have camps, camps of space services, Western launch vehicle services, Western Earth observation. There'll be another block. There'll be another block. Then just speaking personally, um, it's upsetting to me. I I want us to have the most uh, robust international services and certainly space, obviously, is the most international of endeavors that we do. And and I sure hope we don't go to the we, to the moon and onto Mars with different political camps. It, it may be where we're going. And for me, it's just unfortunate. You talked about supply chain and some of those challenges there. But what is an issue that you think is not getting the attention it deserves? OK, to to get a little bit into the weeds, we've had a lot of debate in this country as to how long the International Space Station should, should stay in orbit. And right now, it's uh, the consensus in Washington is to have it remain to 2030. And our um, uh, overseas partners, Japan, Canada, Europe, are are, um, coming to a conclusion, at least to keep their support going for the next couple of years. Uh, But frankly, I don't believe it's up to us. I don't believe it's up to Congress. Um, I believe that uh, with the sanctions that uh, we in the West have imposed on our our colleagues in Russia on the International Space Station, I'm very worried whether they can maintain safety and their commitments on the International Space Station um, until 2028. Pick a number, 2030. I mean, right now, if you're in Russia and you're getting sophisticated semiconductor and sophisticated electronic parts, are you going to allow them? 
to go to service the Soyuz and the progress and your commitments on the International Space Station, or are you going to have? Are you going to be forced? Um, to use them for the more political reasons of the conflict. So one of the issues that I, I have concerns is not being addressed is given the sanctions, can the Russians maintain their commitment on the International Space Station? So Jeff, is there one person or a particular organization that we should be keeping a close eye on this year? <laughs> well, obviously I'd say Voyager. Uh, we, okay, we've uh, been fortunate enough to be one of the winners to develop a private space station, which is you know, my career dream has been uh, private space stations uh, and Starlab is uh, moving along nicely. We've announced a partnership with Airbus and we'll have other announcements. Um, and, uh, and, and so that, that's my plug. Um, but I, I'd say that it's a, it's a wonderful time where we're seeing uh, realignments, we're seeing uh, more and more partnerships between the legacy aerospace companies and and uh, the newer companies. I don't I don't know if we can call them new space anymore. Um, I'm looking for more partnerships between Europe and North America for the reasons we've been talking about in this uh, interview. Um, and so uh, I think there'll be a lot of surprises. Emerging nations, you know, watch what the UAE is doing. Uh, that's very interesting to me. Um, Canada, uh, the, these these emerging space nations, space programs um, are really um, taking root in a lot of different ways. I'm not sure you can call Canada emerging, um, but there's going to be much more a much more diverse group of sovereign uh, space um, partners. Uh, and and uh, those who are affecting uh, our program going forward. Jeff, is there an anticipated mission or event that you're most looking forward to this year within the global space community? I mean, gosh, when you look at everything going on in the world, I have to focus it on the aspirations of uh, Elon Musk uh, and the extraordinary aspirations of Elon Musk. And this year, we might see Starship come alive it's a game changer. It's a game changer in pricing and capabilities, robustness, getting us back to the moon, um, lowering the cost of cargo. Uh, those of us like myself in the inter in the private space uh, station uh, uh, efforts uh, see it as a game changer in how much cargo and people you can move to and from private space platforms. So I think all of us should be watching, just as we watched on Artemis, um, we should be watching uh, for uh, Starship and wishing it uh, well and hoping it, it uh, lifts off uh, this year. Jeff Mamber, President, International and Space Stations with Voyager Space. Thank you. Thank you for joining this year's State of Space. Well, thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you, the Space Foundation. Central to the success of any space-related activity is having a workforce that is prepared and capable of performing. One of the greatest challenges faced by the global space ecosystem today is having enough talent to be able to execute on the increasing demands that public, private, military, and research sectors demand. Addressing those challenges is one of Space Foundation's core mission areas because we believe every mission starts in a classroom. Teachers and educators of all types are the starter fuel to power up the skills, imagination, and preparedness of the emerging talent that will address those missions and more. Joining us today is one of the people who helped fuel that future, Heidi Ragsdale, an award-winning teacher and founder of an organization called STEM Is My Future, LLC, which works with educators to help them better connect with their students in STEM disciplines. Heidi, thank you for joining State of Space. Thank you. Heidi, from your perspective as an educator, what is the State of Space today? The State of Space for educators really comes down to this idea of this explosion of interest for exploration of outer space. Um, and teachers across the world love space and we're trying to keep up with all the things that are happening and bring programming to our students and sometimes that's um that can be difficult 
uh, based on where we're at in where we live and if resources are available for us. Heidi, what are your fellow colleagues and fellow, t- fellow teachers seeing as the biggest challenge in 2023? I would say the biggest challenge right now in education is finding the resources that are up to date enough. And um, once we have a book in our hands in science, it really comes down to using resources that are up to date. And sometimes the book that we get or the curriculum we're given by a school district or provided through our, our system is out of date. Science is ever evolving and we really have to be renegade teachers and go out and find great programming and bring that back to our students. And sometimes teachers have energy for that and sometimes teachers do not have energy for that. What about your students? There's so much happening in space today. How are your students seeing the state of space? I think that students are excited for all things space. Um, from in being invigorated through um, updates from our space in- institutes, fr- from being able to tap into some of the program institutes that provide kits and things like that across um, regions in our in our country. Um, kids love space, and we have to provide them space to learn space. (laughs) Heidi, is there an issue that is not getting the attention it deserves? Yes. Um, When it comes to space education and aerospace education, rural school systems are not being serviced as well as they could. And that comes down to um, not having to travel Teachers not having to travel to programs in big cities like Houston, Colorado Springs, Boulder to get their own training, but having resources available in rural sites. And we need to ask industry to help support that. Um, We need to have uh, loosened uh, restrictions on on taking sick days and going out and being able to use our days to train ourselves to come back and use that material with students. But in rural areas, we also have financial concerns of having to travel, you know, four or five or six hours across the state to be able to get those trainings. And so um, there are virtual space outreach trainings and I believe really, if we wanna train teachers, they need to be in person. And there's these renegade teachers out there in our country and they're they're a part of ambassador programs uh, through the Space Foundation, uh, Space Center Houston. I've traveled several times to the East Coast for training for space education, but that's out of my pocket and not not all teachers have that access. And so we need, to, we need to bring more access and resource training to rural, rural, rural places. Heidi, is there one person or one particular organization that you're paying particular attention to this year? There are two that I'm paying attention to. The, uh, the findings and the photos coming back from the web telescope are phenomenal and they're just going to keep coming. So that one is up for sure. And also um, any sort of remote sensing technology and uh, telescopes that are sending us back information about the, the current climate crisis and using that data favorably to be able to, to tackle climate change with our students is important. So those are the ones I'm looking forward to this year. Last question. What's the, what's the upcoming mission or space event that you're most looking forward to this year? This year is really a buildup for the Artemis mission. We just had the Artemis one 
go to the moon, around the moon and back. And this year we're looking as educators to build energy around the Artemis generation. So the generation that is going to grow up with this as their space system, um, unlike Apollo many years ago. And so I think getting as many resources to kids and educators through training really will solidify that Artemis generation with our the next launch, I believe next uh, 2024. So engaging those those students and communities in those rural areas, especially, is high priority. Heidi Ragsdale, thank you for what you do. Thank you for what you do with our students and, and the future that you touch. And thank you for joining Space Foundation's State of Space program. Thank you so much. With over 90 countries having an active presence in space today, it's no wonder a global space renaissance is unfolding before us. One of the best outcomes of this environment are the partnerships that are being created to advance space exploration, space commerce, and space education. In 2022, the fruits of those relationships brought about history-making successes, such as the new imagery and discoveries of the James Webb Space Telescope, as well as the asteroid strike made possible by the DART mission. All of this while still building on the successes of two decades plus of continuous International Space Station operations. Joining us to talk about the international environment is Dr. Simonetto Di Pippo, who serves as the director of the Space Economy Evolution Lab and professor of practice at the SDA Bocconi School of Management in Italy. Dr. Di Pippo also previously served as the director of the Office of Outer Space Affairs at the United Nations. Dr. DePipo, welcome to this year's State of Space program. Great pleasure to be with you here today. Dr. DePipo, from your perspective as someone who's been a diplomat and you're an educator and you've been a former government official, what is the international state of space in 2023? Well, the status of, uh, of space at the international level is, is, is in a way um, quite extremely interesting uh, because uh, we can see that space activities are blooming everywhere. Um, and there is an increase in, in terms of commercial space players, but there are also some countries, also some developing and emerging countries, which are entering more and more into the space field. Uh, what is extremely interesting is also the fact that space is really becoming the backbone of the current and future economies, because um, really there are a lot of benefits that we can get from space, from the use of space-based data and infrastructures for improving the quality of life on Earth. So what I see is also an increase in um, in uh, uh, multilateral, bilateral, and trilateral uh, collaborations, which is also a good sign of the fact that uh, the entire world um, is is really working together uh, to uh, try to bring, uh, let's say, humanity beyond the Earth limit. So I see uh, that there will be um, a renewal of this interest for space exploration and human exploration of the solar system. And uh, I do believe that also space can be extremely helpful to uh, help humanity in tackling uh, the main challenges that humanity as a whole has to face. Uh, I'm talking about climate change or, or uh, migration or, or um, also the, 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 you know, the, 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 the post-pandemic, um, let's say, situation. So there are a lot of things that space can help with. So what are your fellow colleagues that you've worked with in the international community seeing as the biggest challenge to face in 2023? Well, uh, for sure, uh, 2023 will be quite an interesting year after uh, uh, at the end of last year, we restarted, let's say, the exploration of the moon and in general, the um, uh, human exploration of the solar system. This time, uh, it will be done a, in a cooperative manner. And this is, in my opinion, a breakthrough because it's changing the approach of, uh, of how we are really bringing humanity towards the Earth limits, I mean, beyond the Earth limits. And therefore, the expansion of humanity in the solar system will be a collaborative effort. Uh, and this is a great, uh, let's say, 
point, uh, uh, I mean, the starting point for, for the future. I'm curious, as you've been, as you're now teaching at the Bocconi School, what about your students? How are they seeing the state of space? Well, it's interesting because in, in uh, sometimes, uh, so in my classes, I see people, uh, students that are already strongly interested in the field and others uh, who are just curious. Well, at the end of my courses, usually they all uh, become very, uh, um, let's say, they are enthusiast uh, enthusiastically embracing uh, space activities, which is a good sign. Um, the feeling I have is that uh, this um, young um, uh, women and in, in, uh, in, in young men, really they, they want to have something in their life um, which is linked to the future of humanity. So working in the space field is something that can bring uh, other value also from this standpoint. So it's not only uh, STEM, it's not only innovation, it's not only um, creating, a, uh, let's say, value from an economic standpoint, it's also having a sense of purpose. So is there a particular issue that's not getting the attention it deserves? I mean, there's so much going on, but often there's something out there that is being overlooked. What's that issue? Well, you know, sometimes I, I, I think that even if we do a great job in trying to increase awareness, uh, in particular in the general public, of how important is space for everything we do in our life to these very days, we still lack in a little bit of uh, uh, yeah, awareness uh, uh, in, the, in the public of, of uh, how many satellites they use per day, each day, or or the fact that uh, going into space is not only related to exploring planets or, or for example, you know, sending astronauts in a low Earth orbit or, or to the moon at a certain point in time, but it's really uh, trying to also trying to bring um, the, the benefits and, and, you know, how you can use space-based data and infrastructures to improve the quality of life on Earth. Because, as I said, space is really everywhere in what we do. And, and I believe that also communicating and trying to increase awareness is part of our responsibilities and, and duties. Because space is really the pillar of the future. And the more we do this job of increasing awareness, the more decision and policymakers, uh, in my opinion, will, will take the right, I mean, the, the approach which is correct to for a socio-economic sustainable development uh, all over the world, in particular for developing and emerging countries, but in general for everyone in the world. So is there one person or organization, or for that matter, is there one country that we ought to pay particular attention to, to this year? Well, I, I, um, I believe that there are a lot of uh, projects and interesting initiatives going on. Uh, personally, I'm particularly interested in understanding what will happen with Starship and SpaceX, um, because Starship, in my opinion, is really another revolution. And if uh, the tests that are going on these very moments, right, um, are, are going well, they go, are, are, let's say, will we'll, we'll give positive results, where well, we are um, we are going really quite quick towards uh, the, the potential expansion of humanity um, on the moon and other and other planets is really a big uh, a big um, let's say event that I that I would like to follow uh, as close as possible so uh, I'm really looking at at that at that side of, of the of the medal the other side of the medal more on the public um, I mean from the public perspective so uh, public uh, funds is more on the um, let's say China side because they are really having quite an aggressive plan for uh, you know for uh, um, uh, the exploration of the moon in particular in the South Pole, uh, but also for other programs for Tiangong, so the the China space station and other big programs that they are putting on the table. So I would put uh, a bit of attention on on China too. Dr. DePipo, what's the anticipated mission or event that you are most looking forward to this year? Uh, well, uh, there are a lot of missions that are um, in the pipeline. Um, what I expect uh, to be extremely important is how um, the International Space Station is going to be managed in the, in the next few weeks and months. 
And in my opinion, this is extremely important because I am a strong advocate of uh, space and space activities as sort of a platform for peace and for, because, you know, peaceful uses of other space may help also to improve uh, the relationships between countries on Earth. So um, we, we have really to work uh, towards more diplomacy um, and, uh, and I hope that the space activities and in particular the International Space Station may help uh, towards uh, potential, let's say, good developments on Earth on specific, in specific cases. Dr. DePipo, thank you for joining this year's State of Space program. We're grateful for your leadership in so many things, and we hope to see you at this year's symposium. Thank you so much. Hope to be there. <laughs>